So it's, it's a great honor to, to um, be giving a Michael Feder Memorial Lecture. I went to Princeton and then back to Oxford because I, I went to study, Jonathan Barnes sent me to study with um, Michael, and then I followed him back to Oxford. Uh, he was a brilliant teacher. He always stressed the wonderful complexity of the ancient texts and questions that we tried to examine. I think that some people found the intensity of his intellectual honesty rather difficult. I certainly did, although I still tried to live up to it. But he was also extremely kind. So he would, he would tell me that he had found it best to think a lot about a topic and then just try to write up what he thought without any evasions or hiding behind scholarship. After a slight pause, perhaps one draw on the cigarette that he always had, he would add, people usually find it quite interesting. So you may find it hard to believe when you've heard it, but although it's 25 years late, 25 years too late, this paper is perhaps the, the first I've written that conforms to Michael's instructions. So uh, here goes. And let me just remind you that there's a handout that Michael's going to share on the screen. Uh, sorry, that uh, John's going to share on the screen. I wish Michael could as well. And then the additional handout has some other material, especially the poem by Simonides that uh, is discussed in Plato's Protagoras. I think it's fair to say that Protagoras's views on how to interpret poetry have suffered a bad press. This is the case from the first reports we have from the fifth century BCE, Aristophanes' parodies in the clouds and frogs, through to Plato's stunning takedown of his methods in the Protagoras, and Aristotle's reporting of only his quirkiest points in the fourth century. The Protagoras who emerges from these sources is someone who delights in cheap takedowns of extraordinary poems on the basis of absurd quibbles. So it's not unreasonable to conclude, as Rudolf Pfeiffer did in his fairly authoritative history of classical scholarship, this is uh, handout one, it will hardly be possible to discern the real image of sophistic interpretation through these malicious and amusing Socratic distortions. But if we catch a likeness of the historic Protagoras at the beginning of his own discussion, that passage is quite sufficient to show that he was not aiming at the true reading and meaning of the Simonidean text. The criticism of the wording and sense in which he displays his own superiority is regarded as useful for the discipline of the mind of his pupils. It is this educational value which the Platonic Socrates most emphatically denies at the end. So in this paper, I aim, if not to rehabilitate Protagoras, at least to give him his day in court, my procedure will be to try to use the direct evidence for his work on the Iliad, along with a sketch in Plato of his ideas about the educational role of poetry as a base from which to triangulate back to his theory via the parodies of its application in Plato's Protagoras and in the Frogs. The result, I will argue, is a theory of poetic interpretation, which is technical, dialectical, and constructive. It's technical in applying technical tools of criticism, such as structural analysis, syntactic divisions and principles of disambiguation. It's dialectical in requiring two-sided pro and contra investigations of texts, and it's constructive in aiming at, and perhaps sometimes securing, positive interpretations of or functions for literary texts. The, ca the case is a hard one to make out, however, so I want to note up front that some of the, some of the difficulties in pressing it. The central problem concerns the dialectical nature of Protagoras' theory, since our evidence portrays its applications as one-sided or at best dialectical in the sense that it is subject to dispute by an opponent, such as Aeschylus in the Frogs or Socrates in the Protagoras. This means first, that few of the technical tool tools I ascribe to Protagoras are deployed by him in propria persona in our parodic texts. Secondly, that the dialectical framework has to be inferred from the apparent criticism of his theory. And thirdly, that any constructive results of technical and dialectical applications of his theory are speculative. So the case for the defense needs a lot of work. The first step is to show that contrary to appearances, there are good reasons to look for a positive and constructive Protagorean hermeneutic. One reason is the innovative manifesto Plato gives him at the start of the poetic interlude in the Protagoras, it's passage two, it, which I'll read. It's my view, Socrates, Protagoras said, that a very great part of education for a man is to be skilled at poetry. This consists in one, being able to understand the correctness or incorrectness of the compositions of the poets, two, knowing how to analyze them, and three, 
knowing how to defend one's analysis when questioned. This is the only direct characterization of Protagoras' theory of interpretation. A sympathetic reading would take it as a core of a serious new theory about how to interpret and discuss poetic texts. Each demand on the expert seems reasonable and innovative. innovative. This is especially so in its emphasis, one, on establishing the correctness of poetic composition, rather than taking the poet as the producer of authoritative texts, which was the dominant hermeneutic mode in the fifth century. But constraints two and three also seem innovative and important in suggesting that the way to identify correctness is through division, i.e., I will argue, certain forms of structural analysis, and in demanding that the expert should be able to give a dialectical defense of her analysis. But it's hard to attend to the innovative features of the manifesto, owing to the sequel in Plato, in which Protagoras goes on to di directly to manifest his expertise by trying to take down Simonides' ode to Scopas. The, the poem is given in full in the additional handout on the second page. His, I mean, in full, what we have. His procedure thus looks much more heuristic than serious. It looks like an attempt to demolish Simonides' authority with a single knockout blow aimed at the first lines and designed to show that the poem is inconsistent. And this heuristic picture of Protagoras' expertise seems to be confirmed by the scraps of information we have from Aristotle about his interpretation of Homer. We can see from his evidence, Aristotle's evidence, that Protagoras took aim at the first sentence of the Iliad using grammatical criteria for correctness that are likely to strike us no less than Aristotle as absurd. See passage three on the handout, where Protagoras criticizes the first word in Iliad 1.1 for Homer's misunderstanding of the natural gender of the noun wrath, menis, and handout four, where he takes aim at Homer's choice in the second word in, in 1.1 of an imperative, aede, sing, rather than a request to the goddess. It's hard to know how to read such moves, except as part of an heuristic takedown of Homer. The problem is particularly striking in the case of Handout 3, the argument that Achilles' manly wrath should be qualified as accursed, ulomenon, masculine, rather than accursed, ulomenen, feminine, since we have a parallel argument from Aristophanes in the clouds. There, Strepsides attempts to use his newfound knowledge for making the weaker argument stronger, which included the study of natural theology and natural gender and normative grammar. So he, he attempts to use this newfound um, knowledge against the first of his creditors. So after deriding the creditor for his old fashioned belief in the Olympian gods, Strepsides rushes inside and brings out his heaviest weaponry a kneading pot. This is uh, handout five. Where's the guy who's demanding the money from me? Tell me, what's this? That? A mortar. And you're demanding money after an answer like that? I wouldn't repay a single penny to anyone who calls a morte a mortar. This is funny in Aristophanes because it's simply absurd. There's no way that failing to understand natural genders could render debt void. Likewise for Protagoras, there's no way that Homer's failure to understand natural genders could render the Iliad void. That's just absurd. So you can see why Pfeiffer wrote off Protagoras' theory as an heuristic attempt to show his own superiority. The heuristic interpretation faces a huge problem though, in the face of a scrap of hard evidence for Protagoras' actual interpretation of the Iliad. See passage uh, six on the handout, Ascolian to Iliad 21, 240, the line, a terrible churning wave rose up around Achilles. I read the Scolia. Protagoras says that the following episode, the battle between Xanthus and Immortal, serves to punctuate the battle in order to make a transition to the battle between the gods, and perhaps also to amplify the status of Achilles. <coughs> the first point to note about this comment is that it conforms rather strictly to the second constraint in, in Protagoras's manifesto, since it identifies the set of stru structural episodes that govern the action in books 20 to 21 in a way that is unusually perceptive in the Scolia. To remind you, the scenario in book 20 is that following a change in Zeus's plan, the gods set out to battle one another. And we're told in lines 31 to 74 of book 20 that they drew up against each other in five pairs, starting with Apollo versus Poseidon and ending with Xanthus versus Hephaestus. But the gods don't actually start fighting each other until book 21, line 328, 
where Hephaestus kicks off the Theomachy by blasting Xanthus with fire. The time between these two episodes is mainly taken up by the Aristea of Achilles, which falls into two further episodes, his victories over human opponents and his battle with the river god Xanthus. So the Scalian is right to note that the latter episode serves to punctuate the battle, since it serves to mark out a different sort of combat, human versus divine, and also right that it makes for a transition to the Theomachy, since it allows for a progression from human versus human to divine versus divine via human versus divine combatants. It also seems on the money in suggesting that it amplifies Achilles, since he fights Xanthus to a draw, which is quite impressive for a mortal and ominous for Hector. The Scalian thus seems to have shown that this part of the Iliad is well constructed in a way that Aristotle would approve. So the second point is that Aristotle probably did approve specifically of Protagoras' understanding of the Iliad, since he appears to pick up the terminology of the Scalian in Poetics 23. So that's handout seven on the handout, but passage seven on the handout, which I won't read where he notes that Homer preserved the unity of his plot by taking only one part of the Trojan War as his subject and using many episodes such as the catalogue of ships and, quote, punctuates his poem with other episodes. As Nikau has shown a long time ago, Aristotle appears to be the only Homeric scholar outside the Protagorean Scolion to use the term episode in the sense of structural unit, as ancient critics used it to mean means of varying the action as Aristotle uses the adjective sometimes in the poetics, but here Aristotle calls that poikilia. So that fact, and his use of the Protagorean term punctuate, dear Lampane, strongly suggests that Aristotle used and accepted a Protagorean notion of the structural unity of the Iliad. The final point on this scolion is that we appear to have further evidence of a Protagorean notion of structural punctuation in Socrates' par parodic interpretation of Simonides' Ode. For Protagoras uh, uh, 346, there's a pa passage H, uh, sorry, handout 8a, Socrates uses the same term to describe the pause or form of punctuation that allows him to distort Simonides' claim that he will give his praise and love to anyone, quote, who does nothing shameful willingly, see H, uh, handout 8b. So that Socrates transforms that claim into the Socratic thesis that a wise person like Simonides will, quote, praise and love willingly all who do nothing shameful, since the wise know that no one does wrong willingly. So the pause in question here is a matter of a literal punctuation or phrase division, as Socrates takes willingly hecon with the phrase before it rather than the one after it, which is what the meter demands. Given the level of detail in Socrates' extended parody of poetic interpretation, it's reasonable to infer that Plato is alluding here to the Protagorean concept. This result, which I owe to my friend Hayden Pelitra, is particularly important since it indicates that Protagoras' notion of structural analysis or division went all the way up from phrase and metrical divisions to the division of scenes or entire books. So we thus have some excellent direct evidence that Protagoras was a serious literary critic of Homer and one whose work conforms to the constraints of his interpretive manifesto in the Protagoras. Admittedly, accepting its authenticity leaves us with the difficult problem of squaring the heuristic assaults on Iliad 1-1 with the structural criticism of Iliad 21. Still, if the evidence of Plato's Protagoras is decided, decidedly in favor of the constructive view, as I will now argue, we can count that as a third reason to accept it. So Protagoras' manifesto is tied, that's the passage two again, it is tied to the much wide, a much wider educational theory he sets out earlier in the dialogue. According to this theory, the study of poetry has an important role in moral and political education, the field in which Protagoras is an expert. Protagoras indicates its significance in his first speech, where he gives a genealogy of his profession. While he's the first explicit sophist, moral educator of men, he includes poets, and specifically Homer, Hesiod, and Simonides, among the proto-sophists. One reason for this is given late in, in his later sketch of the function of primary and secondary education in the production of virtuous citizens, which notes the role of poetry for good poets in both the study of grammar and of music. In the first case, for its provision of moral advice and of exemplary behavior and models of excellence. And in the second, also for its inculcation of temperate physical 
and psychological modes in its students. But as his manifesto points out, the study of poetry is also important in the tertiary education that Protagoras himself offers. At this level, where the teacher is an expert at virtue, the instruction burden, broadens out from first order ethics to include meta-ethics, as we can see later in the dialogue itself, where Protagoras explicitly introduces the investigation of Simonides' Ode to Scopas as a way of continuing the debate about virtue, the debate about whether it's teachable, what its parts are, their relation to knowledge, and so on, the debate which he and Socrates are engaged in in the dialogue. So Protagoras is thus committed to the use of poetry as a part of his technical method of studying and inculcating virtue in tertiary education. So it isn't plausible to, to take the takedown of Simonides with which he launches the poetic debate for Socrates as the terminus of his study. The structure of the poetic debate, as we'll see, along with so Socrates' bravura performance in it, means that we never get Protagoras' own view of Simonides' poem. But it's not hard to imagine why he found it an interesting poem to study. It is itself a meta-ethical discussion of the nature of virtue, since it argues that there are degrees of virtue in lines 21 to 40, and in consequence that virtue, if it's not of the highest degree, is insufficient for happiness, lines 11 to 20. These are, of course, two central tenets of the theory of civic virtue Protagoras set out in the great speech, and the first of them is accordingly the point Socrates' tendentious interpretation of the poem is designed to undermine. So there's a good reason to believe that Protagoras' theory of in poetic interpretation was in general aimed at constructive or positive criticism. If this is right, we still have the problem of squaring this aim with a startling set of claims about the first sentence of the Iliad that generated the heuristic interpretation. But we now have a better framework in which to do so, since the question now is how to understand these claims as the products of technical tools as criticism that serve an overall interpretation of the poem. I don't know exactly what to do with the particular technical tools deployed there. The normative grammar is not alien to literary criticism in any age. So I'll subsume them in my general discussion of the, such tools in the next section. But I do have three suggestions about what Protagoras may have been up to with his startling takedowns of the Iliad and other poems by analysis of their first lines. The general one is that his claims are designed, designed to be startling because they're aimed at the most celebrated and most authoritative poets in Greek culture. So the criticisms of Iliad 1-1 may be aimed precisely at cutting down Homer, not as a poet, or even as a great poet, or even as a source of vital ethical information, but rather as simply authoritative. It's not just that Homer occasionally nods, but the allegorists. No, right from the start of the poem, we can see that even his work is subject to, and should be subjected to, critical evaluation. Every word, line, every scene, and the coherence of the whole poem invites analysis. A second suggestion on the same lines is that the first lines of epics standardly tell us something about the relation of the poet to his alleged authoritative, his alleged authoritative source. The notably ungodly muse, Homer invokes by the a command, sing muse. More narrowly again, I suggest that Protagoras was particularly interested in the first sentences of poems because these tend to give vital information about the structure of the poem. Just as Simonides' Ode to Scopa starts with one arm of an apparent contradiction that structures that poem, so perhaps with Zeus's plan in the first sentence of the Iliad. But the Scolia suggests that critics divided on the identification of this plan. Some took it to be a local plan of satisfying, satisfying Thetis by honoring Achilles. Others thought that it was a more general plan of lightening the burden of human beings on the earth. And this difference of interpretation generates two very different ways of reading the Iliad, as structured by Zeus's promise to Thetis, or as part of a sequence of poems. <coughs> so far, I've argued that Protagoras' theory of poetic interpretation was designed to generate constructive criticism that could serve a serious function in the moral education he offered. The next step is to see how it used technical tools in a dialectical context to generate such criticism. I think that we have evidence for this in the poetic interlude in the Protagoras and also in the parallel battle of the prologues in Aristophanes Frogs. But this depends on my assumption that the two sides in each debate reflect the pro and, con and contra presupposed by Protagoras's method. This is questionable, however, since these scenes are easily read instead as presenting dialectical challenges to Protagoras's method. <clears throat> 
or as proposing solutions to problems generated by it. So I start, so, so I start by looking briefly at the dialectical con context in this Protagoras before examining the technical methods at play there, which will provide us with a model for analyzing the richer picture in the props. The poetic interlude in the Protagoras is a break three quarters of the way through Socrates' overarching argument against Protagoras for the unity of the virtues. The interlude is occasioned by the disagreement about the proper methods of debate following Socrates' third argument for the unity of virtues. The result is that Socrates offers Protagoras the chance to take the role of questioner, where he gives model answers, that is, he pretends short answers directly on the question of the sorts that Protagoras didn't want to give in the earlier argument. The scene is thus set up as a dialectical one, a question and answer. Protagoras then chooses to switch the form of the debate to the realm of poetic interpretation, which he introduces with his manifesto, which we saw in uh, uh, passage two. But his manifesto makes explicit that his model for interpretation is already dialectical, since his third constraint is that one should know, quote, how to defend one's analysis when questioned. This implies that Protagorean interpretation included the defensive role that Socrates takes up in the following debate, as well as the offensive role that Protagoras exemplifies in his initial question to Socrates. As a result, it doesn't seem much of a stretch to suggest that the game Protagorean, Protagoras is proposing is an example of his own method. In this case, one in which he has the role of arguing contra, since he's the questioner. By itself, of course, this doesn't imply that Socrates' responses will reflect the arguments pro required by the Protagorean method, as opposed to some other um, ideas. But Socrates has no interest in poetic interpretation, as he makes clear at the end of the interlude. So when his responses are found to reflect a systematic and technical form of interpretation, it's hard not to infer that he's parodying, i.e. reflecting with comic or negative spin, Protagoras's formal methods of defending his poetic interpretations. Note though that for our purpose, we can allow that the direct parody may be limited to Socrates' initial comic responses in 339 to 41, the passage that clues us into the method itself, rather than extending through the bravura, inter bravura interpretation he proposes thereafter. This is controversial. So much for the dialectical framework. There is at least some reason to think that Socrates' responses reflect or parody the technical tools proposed in Protagoras' theory. On that assumption, let's now look at the methods employed in the poetic interlude in the Protagoras. As I see it, the debate works as follows. Protagoras uses a structural analysis of the ode to Scopas to generate an interpretive problem, and Socrates responds by giving a series of possible solutions to that problem that ought to appeal to a technique of disambiguation. In fact, as I've argued elsewhere, Socrates' defense of the poem relies on 14 ambiguities, all of which conform to a set of six forms of lexical ambiguity that are used for resolving poetic problems in Homer in Aristotle's Poetics, chapter 25. And uh, the 14 ambiguities are marked in bold in the full text of the poem that, I, that is given on the handout of the additional material. Luckily, we don't need to look at all of them because Socrates starts with two explicitly joke cases that seem designed to cue us to the technical method he's employing. So it should be enough to look at just these two model cases. The debate starts with Protagoras arguing that there's a contradiction between two assertions in someone in his poem, that is between lines one to three of the poem, this is handout nine. For a man, it's hard, truly, to become good, perfect in hands, feet and mind, built without a single flaw. So contradiction between those lines and lines 11 to 13, the next ones that survive, where he claims, but for me, that saying of Pittacus doesn't ring, didn't ring true, even though he's a smart man. He says, it's hard to be noble. Only a God can have that prize. The interpretive problem Protagoras poses, handout 10 on the, uh, sorry, passage 10 on the handout, is thus that the claim in line one, that to become good is hard, and the claim in line 13, that it's false to say that it's hard to be noble, contradict each other. Socrates' first response is to try to resolve this contradiction by disambiguating the term genestai become in the first line from emini be in the 13th line. Since they assert different conditions, there's no contradiction. So this is passage 11, which I, which I read. Take a look now and see if you agree with me, Prodicus, since it's not clear to me that Simonides contradicts himself. Give us your opinion. Do you think becoming and being are the same or different? Different by God, Prodicus said. 
So Simonides set out his own opinion in the first lines, I said, that it's hard for a man truly to become good. That's right, Prodicus said. Whereas he criticized Pittacus, I said, not as Protagoras thinks, for saying the same thing as himself, but for saying something else. Pittacus didn't say that what's hard is becoming noble, as Simonides did, but being it. But the two are not the same, Protagoras, being and becoming. So Prodicus here says, yet if being isn't the same as becoming, Simonides doesn't contradict himself. And per perhaps Prodicus here would say, like many other people, with Hesiod, that it's hard to become good, for the gods have put sweat on the route to virtue, but that once one reaches its heights, it's easy thereafter, hard though it was, to acquire it. Here Socrates counters the criticism that the poem is badly constructed because it's inconsistent by two moves. He appeals to Prodicus for a disambiguation of the terms being and becoming, and to Hesiod as a potential authority for the substantive view about virtue, i.e. that it's hard to get, but not hard to retain. Protagoras immediately blocks this first solution by rejecting the substantive view about virtue, which he takes to be against the communist opinio, opinio contra Hesiod and apparently Prodicus. But it's clear that it's not a serious solution for poem, since it creates a new interpretive problem, given that lines 14 to 40 of the poem explain that it is in fact hard to retain virtue. And Socrates anyhow explicitly allows that he was playing for time in suggesting it. Socrates' second solution is another explicit joke, this time appealing to the alleged ambiguity in the term calipon, difficult. There's no contradiction because this term means different things in lines one to 13 and 13. This is handout 12 on the next page of the handout, uh, which I'll also read. Perhaps it's the same for the Chians and Simonides. So they take hard to mean bad or something else that you don't understand. Let's ask Prodicus. He's the right person to ask about Simonides' dialect. What did Simonides mean by hard, Prodicus? Bad, he said. So that's why he criticized Pittacus for saying that it's hard to be noble. It's as if he had heard him saying that it's bad to be noble. What else do you think Simonides meant, Socrates, but to shame Pittacus for not knowing how to analyze words correctly because he was from Lesbos and brought up with a, speaking a barbarous dialect? Well, Protagoras, I said, you heard Prodicus. Do you have any response to his view? It's very far from the truth, Protagoras, Protagoras said. I'm quite certain that someone who's meant by hard what the rest of us do, that is not bad, but what is not easy but comes about through a lot of effort. That's what I think someone who's meant as well, I said, and Protagoras here knows it too. He's joking and seems to be testing you to see if you can come to the aid of your position. So Socrates resolves the contradiction by noting an ambiguity in the single term, calipon, it means hard in line one when spoken by Simonides in appropriate persona, but it means bad in line 13 when ascribed to Pittacus by way of sending up his lesbian dialect. Protagoras again immediately rejects the comic disambiguation as unidiomatic, i.e. as generating a linguistic problem in the poem. And Socrates concedes this point because the alleged sense of calipon, bad, leads to a moral problem since line 14 ascribes it to the gods. I trust that these cases are enough to show the method behind Socrates' humor here. As I understand them, the two comic solutions are designed to be exemplary. The dialectical challenge of a contradiction in the poem triggers an analysis of the first line based on a formal method. This method requires Socrates as the respondent or defense to discover, to discover an ambiguity such that line one asserts something that line 13 turns out not to contradict. He has six words in line one to use to try to resolve this contradiction. And since words five and six didn't work, Gnestai and Calipon, the next step is to try words three and four, men and Alatheos, and so on, until he solves the contradiction. And in case you don't believe it, I've catalogued on, on uh, uh, passage 13, the two solutions we've seen along with the two solutions Socrates tries out next in the fourth and fifth rows. And the third column gives a, a third solution that Socrates endorses in his Bravura exposition of the poem later on. The result in each case is that we're offered at least three interpretations of the term in question. The initial debate in the Protagoras thus yields something like the following model. Let's see the summary of the cases on the first page of the handout in the additional material, to, if you want to recap of this. So one, the disputant contra uses a structural analysis of the poem to generate an interpretive problem for it. Here a contradiction, which is an artistic problem. Two, 
The disputant Pro uses a technique of lexical disambiguation to generate resolutions to the interpretive problem. Here in the first case, providing a substantive meta-ethical theory, and in the second case, a factual claim about dialect. Three, the disputant Contra then tries to block these resolutions by appealing to further interpretive problems implied by them. Here in the first case, a second contradiction, i.e. another artistic problem, and in the second case, a moral or theological problem. So the next stage is to try to use the model of technical tools of Protagorean poetics we've extracted from the explicit cases of the Protagoras to look at the similar parody of sophistic poetics in the Battle of the Prologues in Aristophanes' Frogs. This is obviously a, a, a speculative step since Protagoras isn't mentioned in the Frogs, but it's worth hazarding, I think, because the parallel between the two passages is rather close, as scholars have often noted. This scene in the Frogs is, like the poetic interlude in the Protagoras, part of, part of a sequence of debates between the two main protagonists, in this case, Aeschylus and Euripides, battling over which is a better poet. And the two scenes share a number of unique traits, most significantly in their focus on attack and defense of the first lines of famous literary works, and in their common use of ambiguities and disambiguation as the tools of debate. The importance of the latter is made clear at Euripides' first attack against Aeschylus' prologue from the Coephory in lines 11, 26 to 32. This is um, the next page, hand up, the number 14 on the handout. So I'm going to talk about these various uh, passages from this continuous uh, bit uh, as I go along. And here, A stands for Aeschylus, E stands for Euripides, D stands for Dionysus, and the, who's the comic moderator of the debate in the frogs. And Orestes is the speaker of the citations by Aeschylus from his Coephory. So I start at um, 1126 to 32 at the top of the um, quotation. Underworld Hermes, who keeps watch over paternal domain, by now I pray, be, be now I pray my ally and savior, for I've come back to this land and return. Do you have any criticism of that? A dozen or so, but the whole quote is only three lines long and each one contains 20 mistakes. I'm sorry, I'm not very dramatic in my um, renditions. I take it that the joke is not just that there are a lot of mistakes per line, but rather that on a contemporary understanding of what counts as a word, there are actually 13 words in these three lines. So the point of a dozen or so is that each word of this famous first sentence of the play, or first, yeah, first sentence of the play, can be construed as multiply mistaken. So the method looks very much like the one Socrates applies in the defense of Simonides. The first case, lines 11.38 to 50, turns on a double ambiguity in the first line in paternal and domain, preterer crater. Underworld Hermes, who keeps watch over the paternal domain. Now, doesn't Orestes say this at the tomb of his dead father? That's right. So let me get this right. After his father had died violently at his wife's hands in a secret plot, he was saying that Hermes kept watch as this happened. He was not. He called on nether Hermes as underworld Hermes and made it clear that Hermes possessed this function as a, as, as a paternal inheritance. Well, that's an even bigger mistake than I was looking for, because if he possesses the underworld as a paternal inheritance, that would make him a grave robber on his father's side. Dionysus, the wine you're drinking is gone sour. So you need to be sort of more jokey for Dionysus than I'm currently feeling. The, the case works, I think, as follows. One, in 1139 to 43, Euripides takes paternal to refer to Orestes' father, Agamemnon, and his crater to, to refer to his defeat or murder at the hands of Aegisthus. This is actually the interpretation that Aristarchus uh, had according to the Scolia on the frogs. He thus resolves the ambiguities in a way that imputes a moral or theological error in the playwright, since on this version, Aeschylus has Hermes oversee or overlook a murder. Two, in 1144, Aeschylus takes paternal to refer to Hermes' father, Hermes' father, Zeus, and his crater to refer to Zeus's power, which Hermes oversees in the underworld. This works to block Euripides' charge of moral incompetence, but it invites an artistic objection. Three, for while the objection Euripides was about to give in 1147-48 is forestalled, it seems likely that his point would be that Hermes wouldn't be a useful ally to Orestes if his sphere of operations is in the underworld, 
And I take it that Euripides shares Garvey's view that Aeschylus can still of paternal as referring to Zeus as implausible. Paternal and crater in the sense of power are both best taken to refer to Agamemnon, whose ghost or paternal power is in fact the focus of the first scene of the play and Orestes' reason for invoking Hermes. Four, but instead of an ejection of that sort, Dionysus locates a stupid ambiguity in Aeschylus' response to the first charge by reading paternal inheritance, Geras, as if it meant that Hermes inherited booty from his dad. So the second case, lines 1152 to 69, turn on an apparent repetition in the third line of the prologue. Be now, I pray, my ally and saviour, for I've come back to this land and return. The sage Aeschylus has told us the same thing twice. How twice? Look at the expression and I'll show you. I've come back to this land, he says, and return. But coming back to is the same as returning. Of course, it's like asking your neighbour, lend me a kneading trough or else a mortar to knead it. That's not the same thing. That is not the same thing, you fool for folder uh, The translations are excellent. They're not mine, unfortunately. The wording is excellent. How so? Explain to me what you mean by that. Anyone who belongs to a country can come back to it. He just arrives without further circumstance. But an exile both comes back and returns. Very good by Apollo. What do you say, Euripides? I deny that Orestes was returning home. He arrived secretly and without informing the authorities. Very good by Hermes, though I have no idea what you mean. So this is a simpler case, although it relies on a different sort of problem. One, in 1154-57, Euripides fails to disambiguate, come back, echo, and return, katakamai, and so charges Aeschylus with the artistic failure of repetition, or padding, as he puts it in 1178. Two, in 1160-65, to Aeschylus responds by disambiguating the two terms, since one is a standard term, phrase and the other is a legal term. Three, in 1167-69, Euripides blocks that resolution by pointing out that since it's factually false as to the law, and exile's return being a legal fact, it involves another artistic mistake. It's, it's a failure in the representation. So omit the third case in the prologue of, of Aeschylus's Coifree, which turns on Orestes address to his father. It's the lines 1170 to 79, uh, which I've missed out. Uh, since it serves a dramatic function, Dionysus shows that he's picked up the method from Euripides, rather than giving a new form of critical talk. But it's significant, I think, that Euripides' criticism in all three cases are focused very directly on the legitimacy of Orestes' case for killing his mother later in the play, which depends on his legal rights and on divine authority, both of which are put in question here, albeit in a comic way. So there is an underlying serious critique uh, of the um, poem there, I think. The fourth and last case in lines 1182 to 96, sees the sides reversed, since Aeschylus now takes on Euripides' prologues, using the first two lines of his unfortunately lost Antigone. At first, Oedipus was a happy man. He certainly was not. He was born unhappy, seeing that he's the, he's the one who, even before his birth, Apollo said would kill his father, even before he was conceived. So how could he be, at first, a lucky man? But then he became the wretch, wretchedest of mortals. Certainly not became, by heaven because he never stopped being that, did he? Considering that as a newborn, they put him in a pot and exposed him in the dead of winter so that he wouldn't become his father's murderer when he grew up. Then he wandered off on two swollen feet to Polybus. Then as a young man, he married an old lady. And on top of that, she was his own mother. And then he blinded himself. Yes, a happy man, provided he also shared command with our synodies. This is, a, this is a longer and more complicated criticism and harder to pin down since Euripides doesn't respond to it. But I think the central charges are that Euripides is factually mistaken in both his first and second lines, quoted in 1182-1187. Aeschylus claims that Euripides is just wrong in claiming that Oedipus was happy and then became wretched. As we can see from Dionysus' comment in 1195-6, this involves a moral or conceptual criticism. Euripides doesn't seem to understand what luck or happiness are. But it also points to a more urgent artistic criticism. If Euripides is wrong about there having been a reversal of Oedipus's fortunes, then his play is flawed by being based on a merely apparent peripatia. It's worth noting, I think, that in 
in case Aeschylus's criticism strikes you as based on a different critical method, that the charges he makes rely on multiple ambiguities or failures to disambiguate, just as Euripides had. Aeschylus takes the verb in the first line, was, n, in 1182, as predicative, so that it means Oedipus was happy at first, while Euripides presumably took it existentially, meaning there was once a person, Oedipus. Uh, as an aside, as Charles Siegel pointed out, it's tempting to think that this ambiguity leading to Aeschylus' imported contrast between what Oedipus was by nature and what he became was Plato's source for the multiple, multiple distinction between being and becoming in the parallel scene in the Protagoras. Aeschylus' case here also depends on not disambiguating between Oedipus being happy or unhappy and his being fortunate or wretched, sorry, yeah, fortunate or wretched. Although since this is a problem, this problem also affected the scribes of art manuscripts, it's hard to be certain about it. And so on. Once you've caught this bug, the method for ambiguation and disambiguation is inexhaustible. What's exciting about the four cases in the frogs, assuming that they work more or less in the way I've, I've reconstructed them, is that they allow us to keep, catch a glimpse of the potential range and critical efficacy of the te technical method we identified in Socrates' parody of the Protagorean poetics in the Protagoras. It's only a glimpse because these are still poetic examples of sophistic criticism. And it gives us a better picture of the technical tools because Aristophanes' scene isn't primarily designed to ridicule the critical method itself, but rather to use it to make fun of the foibles of the two playwrights. Thus, the next scene, the lost bottle analysis of Euripides' prologues, parodies the repetitive syntactic and metrical structure of the first lines of a number of his plays. This fuller picture allows us to show that the method gave rise to four types of criticism. One, structural criticism of the whole plot, as in the fourth case, the non peripatea of Euripides Antigone, and as attested in Protagoras' initial charge of contradiction in Simonides' poem, as well as at the macro level from books 20 to 21 of the Iliad. Two, moral criticism, as in the first case, Hermes overlooking Agamemnon's murder, and as also attested in Socrates' second solution in the Protagoras, it is bad to be good and gods are good. Th three, factual criticism, as in the second case, representing Orestes' return as a legal fact, and fourth case, representing Oedipus as unfortunate, as fortunate at first, despite his antecedent problems. And four, artistic criticism, as in Aeschylus' response to the first case, eliminating Agamemnon's ghost from the first scenes of the line, the first lines of the scene, and as attested in Socrates' first solution in the Protagoras, making virtue easy to retain in line 13, when it's easily lost in 14 to 16. I don't pretend this is enough to bridge the entire gap between the apparently absurd aristic criticisms of Iliad 1-1 and the constructive innovative theory of poetic criticism Plato suggests that Protagoras held, and whose positive results we saw in Iliad 21. But I think that it does something towards making it seem plausible that a critical method that includes even just two technical tools, structural analysis from phrase division to scene and plot division, and a formal method for disambiguation or ambiguation could yield positive results. The second conclusion I want to draw from the Battle of the Frogs, pro Prologues in the Frogs, is that it's dialectical in the sense of being a unitary two-sided debate, pro and contra. It's unitary or designed as a single piece reflecting both sides on a quest set of questions in the strong sense that the combat combatants are interchangeable with respect to their critical method. Thus, in the first part, Aeschylus plays defense by blocking Euripides' criticisms through disambiguation, as Socrates does in the Protagoras. While in the second part, Aeschylus plays offense by reading Euripides' prologue without disambigu disambiguating its terms, just as Euripides had done to him and as Protagoras did to Simonides in Plato. So Aeschylus plays both the role of Protagoras and the role of Socrates in the Platonic debate. The Aristophanic scene is thus a plausible example of, or skiton, the dialectical model I propose for Protagorean hermeneutics. So I have a coda, um, which has a very funny um, joke in it, uh, but if, I don't think there's time to read it now. So if, you're, if you want the joke, you have to send me an email and I'll send you the um, coda. Thank you. <laughs>